Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Hinge Points. I'm your co-host, Danny Bessner, here as always with Matt Chrisman. Today, the episode you have all been waiting for, the episode on the Civil War and what might have happened if things had turned out a bit differently. So, Matt, this is really your specialty. So why do you think the Civil War in the middle of the 19th century is such a hinge point in American and global history? The Civil War is the culmination of a 70-year-long crisis of legitimacy and governance within the constitutional order that had been established after uh, the failure of the Articles of Confederation following American independence. And the Constitution was this hodgepodge of, of compromises brought together by the merchant elite of the North and the plantation elites of the South, the intellectuals of the South, which I always found interesting, is that the great the great minds, you know, Jefferson in particular was a Southern plantation owner. I always found that to be a compelling uh, thing. Whereas the, the North, I mean, they do have their intellectuals, of course, and Hamilton in particular. Uh, but, you know, they're sort of the industrial might, like John Adams and Sam Adams are kind of a different thing than the Southern plantation owners. Well, because they, the Southern plantator, plantation owners were living the Greek ideal life that slave owning was supposed to allow for, where unburdened by the need to sustain oneself, a, a virtuous gentleman could spend his time applying his mind to questions of governance and then coming to conclusions. And of course, that's how we have received that history as Americans, that these geniuses came together and had their brilliant uh, insights on exactly how government should function. But what it was is a situation where uh, none of the states trusted one another. They had an unintegrated ruling class, uh, but none of them had the ability to overawe militarily any of the others. So there needed to be a uh, coming together under a single government with a concentrated power in, in a federal legislature and executive, which was very threatening to the discrete power of these discrete uh, power holders. Uh, and so the document they put together is designed to accommodate private concentrations of power. Uh, and, and in weird ways. I mean, the three-fifths compromise is a very weird compromise. Like, it, it's, a, it's a strange document in, in a lot of senses, and I think that's because you have different political economic orders, uh, and even in some degree, although lesser, different ideological orders trying to reconcile themselves in a single document. You know, this era of constitution making, which emerges from the Enlightenment, and it... it the, it, it results in this very tension-filled thing that that I think really needed to be resolved at some point. Oh uh, yeah, it had it had to be. And at first, the uh, assumption undergirding the constitutional order was that there would be this general will that every well-intentioned gentleman would pursue, and that is who would fill government, and they would not adhere to any factional interest above a national interest. Uh, and they even said explicitly uh, that the constitutional order wouldn't work uh, if factions were introduced, which they immediately did, around geographic areas and around discrete power centers. And the next 70 years are a push and pull of varying intensities between the southern plantation economy and the northern proto-industrial economy. And once plantation slavery becomes as wildly profitable as it was, which was not something that the leaders of the constitutional era anticipated. Many of them assumed that slavery was going to die out. They were largely tobacco planters in, in the northern area of Virginia. And by that point, the soils was already being depleted. The economy of slavery in the northern tier of the south was already sort of losing its profitability. But the opening of the Black Belt South to cotton planting on large scale just changed the equation completely. And, and that's what we think of when we think of Southern plantations. We think of this sort of just before the Civil War, Tara gone with the wind right. image of the cotton belt of the deep South. Right. But the constitutional order was made by tobacco planters in Northern Virginia. So the creation of this incredibly profitable cotton economy in the deep South and the concomitant pressure for westward expansion meant that this conflict that the constitutional order papered over eventually became unmanageable. And when a conflict is unmanageable by conventional political institutions, the force has to decide. And it did. And the reason that I think of it as such a crucial moment and a hinge point is that the implication to me of this moment, this massive war that kills now we think someone like 800,000 Americans at a time when the population was 
a fraction of what it is now, and destroy the Southern economy was the ultimate rebuke to the constitutional order and the ultimate sign that a new order would have to be imposed that took for granted a conception of citizenship that the constitutional order was explicitly designed to prevent being acknowledged. And I think what's also important to think about in terms of the first half of the 19th century is is that it's an era of increasing democratizing energies. Mm -hmm. So I think the constitution uh, is exactly, as you said, designed to protect, um, you know, particular political economic orders and to uh, basically enable them to come together in a meaningful way so that they wouldn't be just, you know, run over again by the British or the French or, you know, some European empire that is also trying to establish a foothold in the Western hemisphere. But what happens over the course of the 19th century is you get this almost natural unleashing of democratic energy. So the Constitution was also specifically designed to be really elite run. And I think liberalism as a political ideology is inseparable from an an ideal of governance that basically ensures that the demos, the people, don't have an effect on things. And I think this is reflected in the Constitution. And if you look at, for example, the Federalist Papers, all of the writers um, uh, essentially say that one of the most important things is to ensure that the mob, you know, that that the, the, the random democratic energies of the populace don't begin to exert an impact on actual governance. But what happens over the course of the 19th century, and I think, you know, from a Marxist perspective, basically as a function of increasing industrialization, the use of new technologies, the, the, the need for large numbers of people to actually run this political economy, you get this wide unleashing of democratic energies. So it actually first, interestingly enough, I think happens in, in Latin America. You know, the Mexican Revolution of 1810 is, I think, a reflection of that. And then, of course, it happens in the United States in Jacksonian in America and the the beginning of what might be considered to be modern political parties in a sense that we would uh, we would recognize them you know with pageantry and people coming together and parades and you know public uh, public displays of mass governance and this is also something that is happening um, in relation to and as a consequence of the political economic transformations that are inco- uh, occurring over the course of the first half of the 19th century uh, with the expansion of the um, agriculture cultural industry into the deep south and cotton plantations, and of course, the increasing industrialization of the north and the increasing urbanization of the north. And I think this is a theme we see throughout American history with the divide between urban spaces and more rural spaces as well. Yes. And the implication of all of this is that the constitutional order is not capable of absorbing that sort of democratic energy. It, it is designed to diffuse and defeat democratic investment in government. But the army that won the Civil War was the one that was least adherent, least faithful to the Constitution as it was conceived of. I mean, the South was correct in the sense that they were the ones who were guardians of of, of the true Constitution, I think, in that the Constitution as an elite document meant to maintain elite control of governance. The southern states before the Civil War were the least democratic internally. They were the ones where the franchise was most restricted and where government was held in the, the most concentrated hands. The northern states were the ones where as soon as the Constitution is promulgated, you see a rush towards expansion of democratic institutions in states like Pennsylvania and then following suit in other states after that. And the army that wins the Civil War is this massive democratic army, sort of a American version of of the French uh, Revolutionary Army, uh, and commanded by, I think this is sort of telling, commanded by commoners. The Army of Northern Virginia versus the Army of the Potomac at the end of the war, the battle to take Richmond, uh, is between an army led by a, a... deep in his bones southern aristocrat robert e lee and a failed tanner from ohio uh, abraham lincoln was a child of the, of the frontier the, the democratic machinery of, of 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 the north both in the military and in government was now producing this this real people's government and they won the war and then thanks to a number of factors some of them deeply embedded but some of them wildly contingent The next step in addressing the incompatibility of the constitutional order with democratic society was not taken. Uh, And instead, the Constitution, while it was amended in a way that was at the time radical, its fundamental structures were maintained such that within a generation, even those radical Republican Reconstruction amendments 
are turned towards the purpose of defending the emerging corporate powers that will then dominate the government for the next 200 years. And I think what, just to be clear, Matt's referring to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which were famously called the Reconstruction Amendments. And I think that the failure of these amendments to prevent relatively quickly the the you know collapse of Reconstruction and the emergence of a Jim Crow South that effect, uh, effectively lasts until the 1960s really highlights the, the limits of legislation and formal law and affecting life on the political ground. Um, so I think it's important to before we get to the aperture that begins to open with the Civil War, why don't you set the scene of what's going on in the 1850s? What are the interests and who are they fighting? Um, what are they fighting amongst themselves? Because this basically sets the stage for a, what happens during and after the Civil War. So by the 1850s, the slavery issue, which the, the, the second party system, the Democrat and the Whig parties that emerged uh, out of the Jacksonian era, uh, had had a vested interest in suppressing the slave issue. There, there was uh, famously a gag rule in, in the House of Representatives forbidding the uh, submission of abolitionist petitions to government. They, they, they didn't want to talk about it. They all had other agenda items, other policies that they cared about, and they did see clearly that slavery, if it became the central pivot of American politics, could only lead to disunion because it could not be resolved through the constitutional order. But by the 1850s, the war in Mexico and, and then the uh, question of Kansas and Nebraska becomes so overwhelming that slavery becomes the single issue that, that all American politics pivots around. And in that context, the second party system collapses. The Whig Party, which was the party of northern industry broadly, but, uh, but also it was the party of internal improvements. It was the party of the emerging bourgeois throughout the country. Uh, and... The professional managerial class, in a real way, the proto-PMC, the, the people who are going to start managing things yes. in an increasingly complex political economy. Yeah. So in the 1850s, the prospect of slavery expanding into all of the new territory acquired through the Mexican War and also into above the Missouri Compromise line really brought home to Northerners who, until that point, were broadly hostile to abolitionism, broadly hostile to the moral argument against slavery, it brought to them the fear that the United States would eventually be dominated entirely by the planter class, the slaveocracy, as it was called. And the that's slave really power. critical because I think they're really freaked out about the rise of European industrialization. Because I think you could understand the, um, you know, the announcement of the Monroe Doctrine in the 1820s and you know the Mexican American War to some degree to be the United States essentially asserting itself against the emergence of increasingly powerful European empires and in particular the British Empire. You know, now we're great friends with the British, but in the middle of the 19th century, there were real fears that these European empires would begin to encroach on American territories. And so I think at the time, people were worried, if we're centering political economy, people were really worried about the United States being a backwards, anti-developmentalist political economy and a political economy that would rely on slavery as it expands westward, displacing the potential of the industrial might of the North. And I think that's a really critical issue uh, to highlight when understanding one of the reasons why the Civil War proceeded as it did. And there's also the fear that if Slavery became the dominant political economy in the United States that it would eventually be something that all Americans would have to compete with uh, and that the promise of self-sufficiency yeah. and free labor would be dissolved, be, that, that all would have to in some way become integrated into a, a slave economy. And that took an issue that had been mostly a moral one among urban Protestant reformers and made it a popular issue. Right. A uh, material issue. Once things become material, all yeah. of a sudden everyone becomes interested. Yes. And once this happens, once there is this significant shift in priorities, political priorities among the northern farmers and laborers, then the second party system becomes uh, absolutely unsustainable. And the first party to break up under its pressure is the Whigs. And the Whig collapse occurs simultaneously with the emergence of the Republican Party which is the first mass party in, in the United States dedicated to the central issue of limiting, if not abolishing, slavery. There had been previous parties that had attempted to organize around those principles, the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party, and they had had some successes and, and got, won local elections, but had never made a national impact. 
Uh, as soon as the Republicans emerge on the scene, the Whig Party loses its raison d'etre, basically. And for the first time, there is a anti-slavery party in the North. And the grandees of politics in the United States were terrified of this because they rightly saw it as the death knell for the constitutional order because the slavery issue simply could not be resolved through democratic means. And there's an irony here, I think, and it relates to American land. So whereas for a lot of American history uh, from the beginning down until today, land has served as an escape valve for social conflict. You could let off a bit of steam by allowing the immigrants who come into the urban spaces in the Northeast to you know, move west and make their own way in the world. But here is an instance in which the adding of land to the American public actually starks social tensions because there is an irreconcilable conflict between two very different approaches to political economy. Are you going to be a major industrial power in the world? Are you going to be producing manufacturers for the world through the extraction of raw materials you have on your national territory, of course, but are you going to be um, producing manufacturers for the world, or are you going to be uh, a political economy that extract solely raw materials for export to the rest of the world? Are you going to have King Cotton, as it was called at the time, be the foundation of the political economy of the United States? And this becomes a live question in the 1840s and the 1850s because you get an incredible, just a sheer, uh, an incredible amount of land added to this country in an incredibly short period of time. So tensions are heightened in the 1840s and 1850s after the Mexican-American War of 46, 48. And then Kansas and Nebraska in the 1850s, tensions are heightened to such a degree that things are pushed to a, a breaking point that they hadn't been in the previous 70 years when social tensions could really be tamped down in meaningful ways. Yes, because the one thing that had until this point been the ultimate reliever of social conflict, a westward expansion, was now the source of the conflict. Now the, the question of who is going to be allowed in the new westward expanses, who is going to be able to settle was the central question of politics, which meant it could no longer serve as the central alleviator of social tension. So uh, that meant that America left the stage where the governing assumption of power was that any real social conflict could be alleviated through the access of land. Now, with land being the central issue, the fundamental undergirding premise of constitutional order goes away, and all that's left is uh, the shooting. And so the South... As soon as a Republican president is elected, with the connivance of many fire eaters in the South who sought the destruction of the Democratic Party, in order to ensure that, because they were so certain uh, that the only way that the South could survive is, is, was alone, that means that secession becomes inevitable, a war becomes inevitable, uh, and then the, over the course of four bloody years, the United States government, which had been largely hindered in its uh, development of uh, uh, internal mechanisms of uh, power by that very constitution and by the fiat of Southern power erupts. The United States gets its first national currency, which is a fiat currency, the greenback, and it uses that to fund a huge expanse in government power and coordinating ability. And it is with that machinery, the, the Yankee Leviathan, they call it, that they are able to destroy the Southern resistance. And with that, the eventual recognition came in the North that slavery would have to be ended. And by the end of the war, the unified war aim of the North is the abolition of slavery. The live question, though, is what that means. What are the implications of these millions of formerly enslaved people who were explicitly written out of the social contract now being brought into it? And that is the question that Lincoln and the radical Republicans were addressing themselves to when Lincoln is assassinated. And so, again, I think this is a theme that we've seen throughout these episodes, which is that war is crucial to state making. So it's really the civil war that begins to make the modern American state in a real way, this, the type of military state, the type of legal state, this type of economic state that would be able to, over the course of the later 19th and early 20th centuries, begin to assert itself on the world stage. And I think another crucial thing to recognize about the civil war is that it, you also begin to see a concentration of power in the executive. And this, this is why a lot of libertarians 
libertarians, you know, throughout history have always stressed the Civil War as, you know, the, the moment that, when things went wrong, even though they're nominally um, committed to liberty and there's nothing, you know, um, more, more not committed to liberty than chattel slavery. But they point to the concentration of power in the executive and in Lincoln himself as basically the moment the United States takes a wrong turn. And, and probably most famously is Lincoln did— um, suspend habeas corpus, you know, the, the, the legal, legal rights to a, a trial in a particular way uh, that he, he genuinely did suspend uh, during the Civil War. So you, you begin to see two things. You begin to see the creation of this state structure that will slowly be able to, you know, govern the United States itself in a meaningful way and eventually expand imperially to, from sea to shining sea uh, and then uh, across the border and the ever more increasing of power in the executive him. Self. But before we talk about the implications of the Civil War, do you think, and this is a question I go back and forth on, do you think the outcome of the Civil War was overdetermined? Was it impossible for the South to win? Or could there have been, you know, a British Southern alliance uh, that would have provided the South with the necessary, uh, you know, material that would have enabled it to confront the North and prevent, in particular, the Northern blockade of the South? Or were things doomed from the beginning because, you know, the Britain of the, the Victorian era is never going to a lie with a slaveholding society. I think it's a question I go back and forth on, but curious what you think. I I think that there were a few very narrow apertures where there was a potential for a southern victory. Uh, I'd say by 1863, it's it's inevitable that the North will win. I don't think that you can really imagine that any other outcome at that point. I would say that the the high point of the Confederacy's chances were. Robert E. Lee's 1862 invasion of Maryland, which ends with the Battle of Antietam. And is that the bloodiest battle in American history? It's the bloodiest single day. The bo- bloodiest single day. That's uh, what and it is, yeah. amazingly, it happened because the orders that Robert E. Lee had given to his commanders were found by a Union patrol. And amazingly, McClellan was only able with that information to, to get a draw out of it, which one of the, the mind, really. infuriating things about uh, George McClellan. But if that had gone differently, if, if he'd been able to strike up into the North at a time before the Emancipation Proclamation had been announced, there is a chance there that a combination of collapse of Northern morale and perhaps a recognition from Great Britain or France could have secured some sort of political settlement in favor of the Confederacy. But that, that was still a long shot. And I do think that that was a live option but in general, the longer it went on, the more uh, inevitable a Union victory was going to be. Unless Northern will to fight was defeated, and it never was. And I think that highlights the importance of industrialization to the winning of wars beginning of the 19th and 20th century. So you begin to see a new factor of war, and that's literally the ability to produce things. And and you begin to see the rise of a new form of war that we call today total war, where all of society is mobilized in a meaningful way to produce to provide uh, soldiers and to support the will of the executive in power. And I think the Civil War is really important for that introduction of these new material factors into war. And it's it's a hinge point in that sense. It really foreshadows a type of mechanized war that would reach its apotheosis in World War One and World War II. I think has really begun. You should see elements of it in the Napoleonic Wars, but it's really the Civil War. You know, I think it's the first machine gun, you know, the first um, steel plated ships and the new technological developments that indicate that wars will be some something different in the 19th and 20th centuries, and particularly they'll have much higher casualty rates than they did in the past. Yeah, and that was the thing that shocked all society at the time. A Southern senator, I believe, boasted before the war started that he would be willing to drink all of the blood that was shed uh, in the coming conflict because of the overriding assumption that it would be one way or the other relatively quick and relatively bloodless. Uh, Instead, you had four years of unprecedented bloodshed And it had the effect of, over the course of the war in the North, sort of consecrating the cause. Because while slavery was obviously the cause of the war in any meaningful sense, the social mission at the beginning of the war in the North was to save the Union. Like the Union is an abstract concept. The Constitution is an abstract principle that needed to be defended. Right. And these United States becomes the United States yeah. famously, right? And before the war, they referred to as these United States. After the war, it's just referred to the United States as a singular entity. But by the end of the war, the, the sacrifice that had been 
endured was so massive that those abstract concepts didn't have the power to uh, consecrate them. So by the end of the war, among the Union Army and among the Northern electorate broadly, it was well understood that this was a war to end slavery, to, to abolish this monstrous institution of inhumanity. And there was a real consensus that there would have to be a continuation of the struggle once the battles were over to remake the South in a real way, to make liberty a real thing for the former slaves. And that was the tenor of the moment when the 13th Amendment is passed, formally abolishing slavery at the very beginning of 1865, and which is the question that was in Lincoln's lap, the question of Reconstruction, when he was assassinated. So that's the big hinge point. Yes. So why don't we, you know, as they, as they say in Shakespeare, exit uh, from stage right Lincoln, enter Andrew Johnson. Oh, boy. So what? who is he and, and why does he do what he does? And then I want to use this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about Reconstruction, but then to bring in Butler. Because I think Butler is this aperture that really things could have gone uh, in a lot of different ways. So, so who's Andrew Johnson? Why did Lincoln choose him as the VP? And what is his effect on Reconstruction? So Andrew Johnson is the only Southern senator to remain loyal to the Union after secession. He was a senator from Tennessee. He was a son of the poor white yeomanry. He was a tailor by profession who had risen through the ranks of Tennessee politics as a tribune of the white people broadly. And in defiance and in opposition to the planter aristocracy that dominated Tennessee as it dominated all Southern political uh, society. And when the war breaks out, he alone among Southern senators uh, stays loyal to the Union, becomes later the military governor of Tennessee when it's occupied by the Union. And very is, early on in the war, yes. which is always funny when you go to Nashville, they have all this Civil War stuff. But I think 1862 is when they're occupied. Yes. And Johnson is well governor. He's noted for his harsh treatment of rebels, for his solicitation towards former slaves, uh, for his steadfast loyalty to the Union. And for those reasons, he has put on the ticket for the Republicans in 1864 who are seeking at that point to broaden their mandate beyond Republican voters. They, they're fact, looking toward the end of the war, essentially. Yes, they're trying to heal the divide uh, and try to... and by and Bipartisan consensus. Exactly. I mean, they, they don't even run as the Republican Party. Lincoln runs on the National Union ticket, and they replace abolitionist northerner... Hannibal Hamlin with, uh, they wanted a Democrat of some kind, and they ended up with Johnson, the most prominent Southern Democrat who stayed loyal to the Northern cause. And when Lincoln is assassinated, there is this assumption that Johnson's going to be incredibly harsh on the South because of his record as military governor. But he very quickly uh, imposes a policy of almost complete forgiveness of the slave power, of the uh, planter class, uh, Essentially, what he wants is for all of the planters who were uh, disdainful and contemptuous of him during his political career to come to him in Washington and ask nicely for their citizenship back. And whenever they did, he would, because his, his, his resentment of the planter class was always entirely personal. It was a sense of individual narcissistic aggrievement that he was not seen as an equal by these uh, fancy pantses. And that put him in a position of being always just deeply insecure about his own, his own social standing. And once president, surrounded largely by these uh, contemptuous Republicans, uh, he f immediately flees to the arms of the former Confederates. And he initiates a, a reconstruction that attempts to reestablish the status quo before the war, minus slavery, but with all of the uh, social structures around race caste maintained because as an insecure lower class southerner uh, Johnson was fixated on his position relative to black people his position and the position of others like him as not being on the same degraded level uh, as slaves which meant that the social s stratification of slave society had to be maintained and in my mind the most consequential things he did during the the first year of presidential reconstruction when thanks to the Constitution at that point, uh, there was no Congress in session, uh, and he was essentially able to dictate terms from the White House, was to uh, reenfranchise rebels, and also, I think most crucially, 
to reverse any land redistribution to former slaves that had gone on till that point. And there was some significant movement in that direction. Sherman's march to the sea had led to a huge refugee army, basically, of former slaves following uh, the Union Army. And in order to uh, reduce the number of mouths he had to feed, basically, Sherman settled a lot of these former slaves in areas around the Sea Islands and, and uh, the coast of South Carolina on former plantation land. And Johnson set about very quickly uh, evicting them uh, and evicting and, and, and breaking up any concentrations of black land ownership that had emerged in the ad hoc system of contraband management that had carried on throughout the Union Army. Uh, and eventually the radical Republicans come back into power and they in- dictate the uh, radical reconstruction over the vetoes of Johnson. But all of that action happens in a context that has been determined by Johnson and that subsequently can never really be reversed. Right, because of the land, right? Yeah. The, the fundamental realities of the land remain relatively uh, relatively coherent. And this is true, interestingly enough, I think throughout the 19th century world, in Russia, in Latin America as well. It's land redistribution and the, the lack of a land redistribution that allows uh, basically fundamental political, economic, material relationships to m- remain relatively coherent and the social relations that emerge from them to remain relatively coherent. So even though slavery is, of course, formally abolished, you have the institution of Jim Crow which essentially keeps the race caste system, as you were saying, going for another 80 plus years. Um, so it's really that aperture of the post-Civil War moment that that it gets closed relatively quickly with the lack of, you know, massive land redistribution. But things could have been different, right? And let's introduce Butler. Yes. So who was Butler and why is this probably one of the most important missed moments in modern history? So Benjamin Butler was another Democrat. He had been a doe-faces doe-face in the pre-war Massachusetts party. He'd always been an ally to workers. He made his career in Lowell representing the interests of, of garment workers there. But like many Northern Democrats, he was hap- very happy to ally with the interests of the Southern planter class on slavery as long as they allowed him to pursue his provincial interests uh, where he actually was seeking to wield power. In fact, in 1860, he uh, ran for governor in Massachusetts on the ticket of John Breckinridge, who was the uh, breakaway Southern Democrat candidate for president, not even on the Douglas. He was, in fact, mad, mad at Douglas for not compromising enough with uh, the slave power to prevent the party from breaking up. But and this is a story about you have to allow growth, you know, in well, one's life. That's just it, is that Johnson spent his career as this politician just curdling on his own resentments, uh, whereas Butler, when the war begins, secures a political uh, commission as a general, uh, commands troops in Virginia and in Louisiana, and very early on is presented with the question of what to do with escaped slaves who run to his lines, because wherever a Union army would appear in the South, nearby plantations would empty as slaves sought freedom behind the Union lines. Uh, and the, in the very early days of the war, the Union policy was to return slaves to the plantations. Butler claimed them as what he called contraband of war, and then put them to work not only doing manual labor in the camps, but also started to organize them into military units. Then he became the military governor of New Orleans, where he uh, encountered the hatred and and savagery of uh, the occupied Confederate whites with just a growing sense of anger and contempt. He famously issued a proclamation ordering that any Southern lady who failed to show proper respect for a Union soldier to be treated as a woman plying her avocation, which is another word uh, for prostitute. Uh, he was so hated that they, the local whites called him Beast Butler. They called him Spoons Butler because he was accused of stealing silverware from prominent Confederate families, which he did. He was a crook, too, is the other thing. He was, he was a classic mid-19th century Patronage type politician, craft politician, craft, yeah, yeah. Which I, if only we had more of that today instead of the technocracy, yeah. where just denies people. Yeah. Stuff. It was, it was, it was an element of democracy, is the thing. It wasn't just absolutely. Corruption. And that's important to underline. I think that really is an element of democracy. This sort of distribution of patronage, the distribution of goods is actually crucial to democratic functioning, at least historically. And so the replacement of those sorts of things with technocratic governance as the result of the progressive era of the turn of the 20th century, I think has resulted in a lot of things that are negative. But Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
So Butler is eventually recalled from New Orleans because he created such a stir and, and so much outrage. Even he, he created international incidents, even by for in one case hanging a man who had pulled down an American flag and stepped on it. But when he came back north, he was feted not by the Democrats, who now thought of him as a horrible monster, but by the Republicans. Uh, and so he switched his party allegiance to the Republicans. And he, I think most importantly, had experience during the war of actually commanding black troops in battle uh, and, and, and experiencing you know, that reality. And, and the creation of brotherhood. I mean, I think it's it's difficult to appreciate in a political uh, moment where so few people serve, but the bonds of war are, are genuine and they're real, and they have served as progressive forces throughout modern history. And I think this is one of the moments where you see someone recognizing the humanity and empathizing with people about whom he knew very little due to the exigencies and realities of the awfulness of war. So by 64, he is much more sympathetic to black Americans than he had been and wildly less sympathetic to Southern whites than he had been, especially specifically rich Southern whites. Yeah, growth, uh, and, emotional growth. But because of his reputation as this Democratic doe face, he was offered the vice presidential spot before Johnson was. Yeah, so let's underline that. He was offered the spot. Yes. So this is like, again, moments where binary one, zero, yes, no decisions actually do have enormous impact on history. And it raises interesting philosophical questions about structure versus agency and where one operates when. Because on this podcast, and I think as a general approach, it's important to really emphasize structure, um, particularly in this political moment, in the neoliberal moment where agency is overemphasized. But there really are moments where individual actors in history make choices and things go a different way than they would have otherwise. Yes. Uh, in his biography, Butler says that he told Simon Cameron, who had offered him the spot, that he would only take it if Lincoln agreed to die three months into the term. Little uh, did he know. Because, and he turned it down also because uh, at that point, the vice presidency was not considered a route to greater power. It was considered the end of a career. Uh, and also, he wouldn't be able to be a lawyer again if he'd been vice president because that would have been undignified. So, I.e., he wouldn't have been able to make money. Exactly. So right. he's, he turned it down and it, they went to Johnson instead. And this, I think, is an incredibly important aperture because if Butler becomes vice president and then is president, assuming Lincoln is still assassinated in that universe, you would have had in office someone fully committed now to a radical reordering of society in the South, uh, someone who showed a willingness throughout his career, both before this and in, in our world after this, to be vengeful to, against assaults on the dignity of, of the United States and of former slaves. Yeah, the dignity of freedmen. Yeah. So in the real world that we had, uh, Butler becomes, after the assassination, a uh, radical Republican congressman from Massachusetts and becomes one of the key figures in passing all the most important civil rights legislation after the war. But I think, crucially, he also becomes one of the most prominent Republicans to embrace soft money. And I do think that the question of currency ended up being incredibly important to the destiny of the re of reconstruction so johnson's time of presidential reconstruction is immeasurably harmful to the project of reconstruction but what really kills it what really puts a stake in the heart of reconstruction is one obviously the violent resistance of uh southern whites which was uh, only spottily uh uh repressed by the by, the by yeah. by the union uh, army and occupying forces but also the uh, collapse of the economy in 1872 uh, which the first great recession which right, was 72 73 which was responded to by a deflationary movement towards the gold standard which was carried out by the elites of the republican party who wanted to end slavery because it was a violation of their liberal principles of, of individuals competing in a free market, but who had no interest in, in, in a social revolution. But there were Republicans during that era who were fully uh, willing to continue spending money that was not backed by gold, like Benjamin Wade in the Senate, but also Benjamin Butler, uh, and a soft money reconstruction that was dedicated to land redistribution and defending Fried Friedman's rights, I think could have, would have applied pressure on the constitutional system uh, 
uh, that would have required a real reckoning with it and would, I think, have rearranged the political landscape of the United States. Uh, and we would not have had the situation that we got, which is uh, a pact between the Democrat and Republican parties to essentially sacrifice the formerly uh, enslaved people on the altar of progress, the uh, reification of the, a robber baron capitalism as the predominant model of growth, and a partisan system where people essentially voted against the party that shot their dad or whatever during the war, but without any further uh, ideological valence other than that. And a Butler regime that comes into office waving the bloody shirt, not of an anonymous Friedman or Scalawag, but of Abraham fucking Lincoln himself, decapitates the Southern slaveocracy, dispossesses. Right. I think that's crucial. The dispossession, I think, yes. is critical. Dispossesses the slave like power. Like a denazification de effort that actually happens. Right. And then redistributes land. Now, I don't think Butler as president guarantees that those processes lead to some, you know, vast Utopia. acceleration yeah. <laughs> of uh, social forces so that, you know, you don't have racist backlash, you don't have violence, you don't have the perpetuation of racism into the 20th century. I think all those things are baked in to the pie of America at that point. But the uh, trajectory, the, the, the speed and the shape of conflict, I think, would be radically different. And, we, and you might see something like the Civil Rights Act of the mid-1870s uh, pass. Well, that's the thing. Is you that, know, like stuff like that. You might see the formalization exactly. of these types of genuine civil because rights laws. Because all, all, all of the stuff that got passed in the 1860s was on the table and in some cases was passed, although it was then rendered toothless by lack of enforcement and then uh, Supreme Court rulings. It was all on the table in the 1870s. And in, in a Butler administration very well could have seen them not only passed, but enforced at the point of a gun by the government. Uh, and in a situation like that, I think that the reactionary forces that end up at every turn in American history battening down all of the progressive uh, eruptions and potentials of the moment might be uh, deflated. The way I, always, I think of it is, is that we live in the, Butler, in the world where we get Johnson after Lincoln, and then we get Truman after FDR. And those two hinge points both push us in one direction. In, in pretty bad directions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that if you have Butler as VP, then you probably still have capitalism in America. You probably still have the rise of the uh, industrial capitalist conflict in Europe. You have a massive conflagration in the first half of the 20th century. But by the end of that conflict... Maybe you have a president who maybe he isn't FDR, but he is a similar figure who is replaced by a figure like Henry Wallace, for example. Maybe those they aren't Democrats. Maybe that's the Socialist Party. And I think here it's it's an interesting way to think about it. It's the what what does American liberalism become? Liberalism could have conservative, and liberalism could have more left wing variants. And the history, as it turned out, I think pushed us to the right of liberalism as a phenomenon. Uh, you know, an emphasis on empire, an emphasis on individual rights, an emphasis on um, you know exchange and things like that line. But with literal different people pushing different policies, you could have had a more humane liberalism. I think socialism, at least. In the United States, would have always been difficult due to the, because the land question yeah. just just makes things more difficult here, generally speaking. But you could have had a, a kinder, gentler liberalism that might have pushed in a more genuinely social democratic direction, particularly if there was a way to unite the northern white working classes with the freedmen much earlier than happened in like which uh, Elizabeth Cohn talks about in her New Deal book. It talks about in the 1930s. What if that happened in the 1870s right. or 1880s? You have total new social relations and social constitutions that just didn't happen partially because of who was president at the time. Yeah, because you have the, the embers of those things there, but they're all stamped out by these overdetermining factors. And I could just see a situation where the two parties, the two main parties that emerge from a, a more progressive reconstruction are not the Republicans and Democrats, with very little ideological distinction between the two, defined almost entirely by region and by the history of who fought who in the Civil War, but maybe this, the Republicans or the Democrats and the Socialist Party. Now, that It allows for a socialist alternative to arise genuinely. Exactly. Because people are pushed toward it from the left side of liberalism. It's more of an opening yeah. for that sort of alternative. And, you know, by the mid-century, it's probably still a Socialist Party that is functionally capitalist, but 
just that reality of it being a socialist party, of, of, of it being organized around ideological principles and of self-aware class project means that in that big reckoning moment that happened after, in our world, World War II, there would have been more social power behind a alternative to Cold War, the continuation of military buildup and neocolonialism in the developed world. And who knows what that leads to, but it does feel like there's two parallel Americas, one where we get Johnson and Truman and one where we get Butler. And because we got Butler, we get a Wallace, Wallace. type figure. And, and then then who knows? And that also raises interesting questions, and we could close on this, but let's say there's genuine land redistribution in the uh, United States of the 1870s and the 1880s. What does that say about populism, right? Because let's say there's a recent history of people democratically taking control of the land. You could see uh, new alliances between, you know, populists, freedmen, northern workers that were just closed off with the total catastrophe of Reconstruction as it actually proceeded. In the teeth of the wild racial reaction of the post-war era, there still were effective political coalitions between former slaves and populists uh, throughout the South, uh, mo and they were suppressed at the barrel of a gun, most famously the Wilmington coup in North Carolina. And there was the Readjusters Coalition in Virginia, which was spearheaded by a former Confederate general, but was a, a coalition of populist whites and former slaves. Th that happened even in our In the shit awful, world. horrible reaction <laughs> of the racist South. Yeah, but imagining a world where the nascent alliance between former slaves and poor whites who had opposed the Confederacy, which was a significant number of them, that did exist in, in uh, embryonic form after the war is nurtured. A redistribution of land that encompasses both former slaves and poor whites occurs. The, the, the end of slavery is seen by not just former slaves, but by the common white people as a positive social good. That takes a phenomenon that happened anyway in, in the in the miserable conditions of deflationary uh, robber baron 19th cent, late 19th century and gives resistance to those currents, the, the wholesale purchasing of this new government structure by capital that happens after the war. Uh, it gives it a, a teeth and it gives it a spine of resistance that doesn't exist, that didn't exist in our uh, history. And it's a genuine democracy. And I think it's it's important to make clear, we're not saying that like racism would go away. Right. Yeah, no. What we're saying is that there were particular constellations of interests that could have resulted in people meeting each other and developing the social relations that over time would have led to an attenuation of the, uh, the horrible hatred that existed uh, within the country during uh, and after the Civil War. And crucially, I think it would have pushed for a reckoning with our political institutions. And it would have Which meant we never that got. the Constitution, as we understand it, would, over time, I think, been radically broken up. And I just we, want to make clear very quickly, we're one of the only countries in the North Atlantic that is still operating off of its yeah. original Constitution, even with amendments. That is fucking insane. Yeah. And I think a, a structure like that means that the political forces that are uh, available and that mobilize when you have that early 20th century capital crack up, that's happening in any universe. Right, definitely. Uh, that the response to it, instead of people basically as the only place to effectively put their energies being voting for this democratic party that is structurally committed to capital uh, throughout all of its the various iterations yeah yeah like and at every level of power and, and that just kind of absorbs all of this popular energy and does change the party but not sufficiently uh you have a situation where maybe the party that that exists to channel that energy is one that is explicitly oriented in Hostility to capitalism. Right. So I think what would have happened, not necessarily, but what could have happened with Butler is you get the formation of a cross-class, cross-race demos that is able to serve as a counterweight to capitalism as opposed to what happened in our real world where that just didn't, those social relations never formed. So there was never that sort of offset uh, to capitalism that might have otherwise existed. And I think the you don't even need to imagine Butler presiding over some enlightened uh, anti-racist project, all you really would have needed to keep the, un the northern populace on board with a really radical reconstruction from the get-go is these fuckers killed half a million of your fellow citizens and Abraham Lincoln. 
Let's fuck them up. Let's hang them from the goddamn posts. I certainly sure shit don't think that ben- Benjamin Butler was president, that Jefferson Davis would have gotten two years in the clink and then gotten to write a self explanatory memoir. And I think that goes for the entirety of the, the leadership of the Confederacy. And it absolutely would have meant a punitive confiscation of property from the people who everyone at that point understood started the goddamn war in the first place. I know it's also really interesting because, you know, we're having fun here, uh, but imagine a Nuremberg-esque <laughs> trial in the post-Civil War United States where you get, you know, instead of the antecedents for crimes against humanity happening in 1945, what if something like that happened in 1865? I don't think it would have been enforceable, right? But you could imagine new ideas and new ways of looking at the world being generated for, from those sorts of punitive post-war actions where you actually as a society come together and say that, you know, this is not acceptable. These sorts of crimes are not acceptable by quote unquote civilized society. So you get the formation of an earlier type of international law and maybe it wouldn't have been so toothless as it turns out to have mostly been. Yeah. At the, there was a villain that would have been... Yeah, there were genuine villains. There was, there yeah. was, there was an entire slaves. class of people who everyone understood were the villains of the story that they had just endured. But for Johnson and then later for the uh, reactionary capitalist Republicans who dominated the party, uh, absent any leadership in the executive, especially after they install uh, U.S. Grant, who did some very good things to uh, defend former slaves' rights, but uh, was at the end of the day a cat's paw for the hard money pro-corporate Republican Party, for them, s- diffusing that responsibility was crucial because the, the, the project of creating a multiracial uh, democracy with uh, a redistribution of land and power downward was just antithetical to their interests. And with no social base basically balancing against them, there was no real way for it to go otherwise. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for listening to Hinge Points. Uh, if, if only Butler had been the VP oh. instead of Johnson, things would have got differently, uh, and we really appreciate it. Bye. Bye.